everyone ready? Hello from the Lauterpack Center of International Law at the University of Cambridge. I'm Mel Schwing, the Vice President of the Cambridge Arbitration Society and the moderator for today's session of the Cambridge Arbitration Society and Lauterpack International Center Lecture Series. Today's presentation is an interesting one and is on multiple courts and tribunals, forum competition, fragmentation, or complementarity. We have two outstanding speakers today on the topic. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Jan Yaginsu is a barrister and arbitrator practicing commercial law and international law from four new square chambers in Lincoln's Inn in London. Aside from his practice, Jan teaches a course in investment law and arbitration at Georgetown University Law Center and a course on international human rights law at Columbia Law School. He is a member of the IBA's Committee on Investment Arbitration and perhaps more pertinent for us today, a partner fellow at the Lauterpreck Center of International Law. Dr. Hike Fupilance, excuse me, practices international dispute settlement at Deckard LLP. Prior to joining private practice, he was a university lecturer at Cambridge where he taught international commercial litigation and conflict of laws. Sovereign debt and sovereign debt litigation are among his principal interests. His monograph on sovereign defaults before domestic courts was published by the Oxford University Press in 2018. His book was based on the PhD he completed at Cambridge under the supervision of Dr. Richard Fenneman, my supervisor as well. And Hike's uh, PhD received the York Prize from the Faculty of Law at Cambridge. The format for today is simple. Jan will speak for approximately 25 minutes on the topic and then it will hand off to Hike, at which point he will speak for 25 minutes. We'll have 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you have any questions during this, please enter them in the Q&A fu &A function on, your, uh, on the Zoom. And with that, and with, uh, because I know you didn't come here to hear me speak, I'm now going to hand it off to Jan to begin his presentation. Thank you. Mel, thank you very much uh, indeed. It's a real pleasure to be back in Cambridge, albeit on this occasion, unfortunately virtually. I'd like to open by just congratulating both the Lauterpacht Centre and the Cambridge Arbitration Society for putting on another terrific lecture series for Lent term. It's, it's a real privilege to be a, a, a part of it this time. I mean, I enjoyed in, in, in particular, you mentioned my affiliation to Georgetown. It was, it was great to see a couple of weeks ago, Anne-Marie Whitesell come and join you with Samar Haridi. That was a great session on soft law and international arbitration. But today we've been asked to say a few words really about the interplay between the courts um, and arbitral tribunals in principally the commercial arena. It's a great topic. And I suspect that the issues that we introduce, that we discuss today, are going to be here with us for some time. I'm really coming to this subject, or this topic, as a barrister, and one who acts in a fair bit um, cases before the English Commercial Court, as well as the other commercial courts housed in the Rolls Building in London. But I also have a fairly wide ranging practice as an international arbitration council. And at the moment, I have more arbitrations afoot than I have court cases. And as any commercial barrister will tell you, that's always a balance that's in constant flux. But I also want to approach this question from the perspective of arbitrator. And in my capacity as a court appointed expert on English law, as an arbitrator, of course, one's focus as a barrister at least shifts very quickly from the business of persuasion to that of fair adjudication. And as a court appointed expert on English law, I've had my fair share taste of what hearings look like in courts housed um, outside of England and Wales. And what I'd like to do in the 20 or so minutes that I have um, uh, today is to really 
open with the theme of forum competition. Generally, in the field of international dispute resolution. And then I'd like to move to perhaps a more nuanced um, consideration of the relationship between commercial courts and, and commercial arbitral um, tribunals. So let's start with competition. I mean, there are some fairly tired looking debates out there, I think. They've been ongoing for a while. What's better, international arbitration um, or uh, uh, litigation. What's better, common law or civil law jurisdictions? What's better, this law or, or, or that law? And it embarrasses me uh, to rehearse those um, uh, sort of debates here, and I won't because we're at Cambridge, but for those contemplating um, who are not yet in practice, but contemplating uh, a life in practice, that's what you're going to be hearing in a lot of these conferences. And those sorts of binary arguments, as you will well imagine, end up um, in fairly reductive places. And they often serve to miss the subtleties and also the realities of practicing, I think, in international dispute resolution today. Really, I think there've been two key broad developments in the last sort of two decades or so. The first is the, the effect, really, of the proliferation of arbitral centres around the world. I mean, gone are the days where the ICC or the LCIA are, are equal international arbitration or in any meaningful way represent the only real options for, for users of arbitration. There is still a challenge to that all old order I think afoot and I think it's effect really and I say this as, as someone um, from the perspective of counsel and arbitrator I think all that's served to do is to improve the arbitration offering across the board because institutions in competition with one another are trying to give effect to the promise arbitration, the promise that it's going to be fast, the promise that it's going to be efficient, and the promise that it's going to lead to a final resolution. Um, and for that reason, I think we've seen in the past decade or so, you know, the, the, the institutions renewing their, their rules and their approaches in commercial disputes. But the second key development, and I think it's one that's even more on topic for our purposes, is the rise of specialist courts. So snapshot, 2018, you see three courts around the world being established in that one year alone. You see the International Chamber of the Court of Appeal of, of Paris being established. You see the Chinese First and Second International Commercial Courts being established. You see the same year, the Chamber for Commercial Matters of the Frankfurt Regional Court established. And that's really the culmination, I think, of a trend that probably began in the late 90s. And a, a meaningful place to start was probably the founding of the Hong, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal um, in the late 90s. And then you had the Dubai International Financial Center Courts in the mid noughties And in 2010, you had the Qatar International Court Five years later, the Singapore International Commercial Court, and the year after that, the Abu Dhabi Global Market Courts. You may have noticed most of these courts have the world international or global in their names. But the reality is that these are domestic courts. And importantly, that means that the enforceability of any judgment rendered by any such court will really depend on the domestic laws of the enforcing state. And the enforcement position is, of course, one of the main advantages that international arbitration still holds over litigating in commercial courts. And that's, an, generally speaking, that's an advantage that arbitration is likely to hold on for some time. Just to make the point good by reference to an example, take for instance, the Netherlands Commercial Court. 
you argue a case there, you receive a judgment. You'll probably have what? Brussels regulation, Lugano, the Hague Convention um, at your fingertips to be able to, for the purpose of recognition um, and uh, enforcement. That's probably over 30 or so jurisdictions. Now compare that to the position if you proceeded by way of arbitration and the New York Convention was applicable. There you've got global coverage of, I think, 168 or so states parties. Now that is a major advantage to arbitration. But look on the other hand, the court fees in that Dutch court are fixed. They're fixed at 15,000 euros for a first instance decision. They're fixed at 20,000 euros for an appeal decision. The parties can litigate before the Dutch court in English if they so choose. Video conferencing is an option. And the court can, of course, as other courts around the world, apply foreign law. Now, contrast again, back to arbitration. Think about all the controversies in international arbitration that have arisen around virtual hearings. I mean, I've, as a practitioner, lost count of the hours that I have spent debating that issue for clients before arbitral tribunals since we were all forced into our present day Zoom existence. Should the court wait until there is the possibility of an in-person hearing? Is a virtual hearing a satisfactory substitute? Um, if so, what is the protocol that should apply? That's just one issue. Contrast also the position on costs. I mean, the costs of a commercial arbitration today can very easily run into the hundreds of thousands of euros. That's just simply the arbitration costs, if not millions. Now, taking a step back, clearly the aim of some of these specialist courts and the proliferation, the newer ones, is to bring international commercial dispute resolution either back to domestic courts, or in fact, for some jurisdictions, it's to bring these disputes to the domestic courts, probably for the first time. So <clears throat> we'll have to see what impact, in fact, the proliferation of specialist commercial courts have on international arbitration. But I anticipate it will be an uphill struggle. I mean, commercial parties, at least in my experience, they like the autonomy that comes with international arbitration. They like the sense of choice. They like the procedural flexibility that comes with that choice. They like the ability to play a part in choosing members of their tribunal. Some really, really do like the confidentiality that, that pertains to proceedings. But I just want to flip the question on its head because Either way, surely as a jurisdiction, as a country, you don't want to be pulling users away from arbitration to your courts. You want to be pulling users to your jurisdiction. Now, England, look at the relationship here between the English commercial court, or I should now say English, English commercial courts, and English commercial arbitration. It's an interesting model. I'd characterize it as one of mutual support. It's not, in England at least, a question of moving cases to the courts away from arbitration or vice versa. It's a question of moving cases to London. Now, let me make that contention um, good by reference to some figures that I looked up hastily today. The commercial court has had a record year this year. If you look at April 2020, so during the COVID period and, and, and the period ending March 2021, the commercial court handed down just under 300 judgments, more nationalities were represented and more litigants appeared in the courts than ever before. And although predictably the proportion of EU litigants continued to decline, that decline was comfortably offset by other foreign litigants, notably from the United States and then Russia and Ukraine in that order. So you might expect 
some of that work flowing into the courts to have cannibalized the cases flowing into the principal center of arbitration in London, the LCIA, the London Court of International Arbitration. No, 2020 was also the LCIA's record year in terms of caseload. It saw an 18% increase over the preceding year. There were just under 450 referrals and 86% of the parties bringing those referrals were from countries other than the United Kingdom. So I think we need to frame the discussion not as one around competition between litigation and arbitration, between arbitral tribunals and courts, but around the competition for civil justice or commercial dispute re resolution if civil justice sounds too grandiose. And in my view, at least, the most competitive jurisdictions are the ones where the courts and the tribunals speak to one another, flourish together and support each other. Now, I think that probably is the present day position in England. Litigation and international arbitration are mutually supportive. They enjoy a sort of symbiotic relationship where the strength of one helps, I think, secure the strength of the other. So I don't really see it, or we'll see the courts and arbitration as in competition or in some sort of struggle or agon involving some sort of zero sum game whereby the gain of one means the loss of the other. Arbitration strength is one facet of the framework of law that the civil courts help to provide. And through the Arbitration Act, the English courts provide a light touch, sort of supervisory accessory role supporting arbitration to adopt Lord Thomas's phrase, the court's role is one of maximum support, minimum interference. So the court provides that support through ensuring that English law maintains its commitment to party autonomy to certainty and to the predictability in commercial, um, uh, in commercial law itself, in contract law itself, and ensuring where necessary that the law itself remains flexible and is able to develop. Now, I think there's been some debate in this regard as to whether the Arbitration Act has reduced the commercial court or the English court, the English commercial court's ability to ensure that the law can develop appropriately. At least to my mind, I think the balance the commercial court has struck through the test for appeals on points of law is broadly right. It's a test that properly respects party autonomy, but while at the same time enabling appropriate disputes to come before the court. So in other words, support where it is wanted or support where it is needed. Otherwise, I think in many other respects of dispute resolution, the courts, at least in this jurisdiction, ensure that party choice is respected with an emphasis on finality in accordance with the wishes of the parties. Um, let's look at it the other way around. Um, I'm of the view that the support that the English courts provide for London arbitration is support that is reciprocated. And I think it's fair to say that the dynamism of London arbitration, or English arbitration, I should say, is in its own right a real strength for legal London. It's a, one of the reasons that um, lots of different um, parties from different jurisdictions come um, to have their disputes resolved in this neutral um, uh, seat. But English common law, I think, and particularly English commercial law has to a significant degree been shaped by material provided by the commercial court or um, by arbitral proceedings seated here. And let's bear in mind this, the support that arbitration provides for courts 
goes beyond furnishing material through which the common law and commercial law can develop. Let me explain. So while arbitrations may mean that some disputes do not come before the courts, the practical experience derived from arguing those arbitrations and deciding them is actually not lost to the courts because it's experience that can and is brought to bear in arguments before those very same courts because what the court loses in terms of perhaps some precedent as disputes are determined by arbitration, it still gains, albeit indirectly. And the experience gained in arbitrations, both in London and abroad, increases in turn the skills and the attractiveness of the legal profession here, and of course, the English judiciary, thus thereby increasing the international reputation of the English courts and those who practice before them. There's always scope for more, and each is or ought to be receptive to learning from the other, to the mutual benefit, I think, of both, especially perhaps in the realm of procedural innovation. And we see that in some of the innovations being introduced now in the newer international commercial courts. There's a borrowing from international arbitration. And I certainly don't wish to suggest that London represents some sort of international disputes Arcadia, but its strength I think has been in its ability to change or its ability to adapt to the requirements of users, both through its courts and through the arbitral proceedings seated or administered in England. Now those are by way of general observations on this topic and I would certainly welcome any questions, especially that relate to practice rather than policy when it comes to finding oneself before these courts or arbitral tribunals. But I want to close my opening remarks by I think making three points. The first is this, I think to my mind, the place of international arbitration in global dispute resolution is, is pretty secure. And at its most basic, I think arbitration fills that essential need of providing a, a neutral forum with appropriate expertise for the resolution of international commercial disputes without requiring either party to agree to the other's court jurisdiction. But secondly, I'm now repeating something I opened with, the enforcement position, I think, continues to give arbitration a huge advantage over local courts. I'm speaking, of course, generally. London arbitration, you'll notice, has been wholly unaffected by Brexit, when you take into account the figures that I've just rehearsed to you. The New York Convention, of course, has nothing to do, at least for now, with the European Union. But it's also interesting to see that the London Commercial Court has been unaffected by Brexit and that its resilience really comes, well, I'll put it this way. I think that sort of resilience or a jurisdiction comes where arbitration and litigation are not pitted against one another, but play a mutually supportive role. And finally, and this may be something that we can explore in, in Q and A, but I, I think arbitration needs to be alive to international sensitivities. And, um, I've not really been able to touch on investment arbitration as yet, but there is clearly a cool wind blowing at the moment in terms of public opinion as regards investment arbitration. For many, international arbitration and investment arbitration are the same thing. And there is undoubtedly a need for international arbitration generally to be perceived at least publicly as, as, as fair to developed and developing world alike. Um, Mel, I think I'll stop there um, and um, come back to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. That was very interesting, Jan. Um, we've already got some questions coming in. Please continue to uh, send them through. But I think just for uh, ex uh, you know efficiency purposes, we'll go straight to uh, Hike and have his presentation. And then we'll try to uh, answer everyone's questions at the very end. So uh, I hand it off uh, to Hike now for his presentation. Right, thank you very much, Mel and, and Jan. Um, 
it is a great pleasure to be back in Cambridge, um, um, albeit virtually. Uh, I think the preference of all of us would have been to be now uh, at the great lawn behind Mel's back at the Lord Park Centre. Um, and, and I, I second what, what Jan said, thanking the uh, Lord Park Centre and the organisers, of course, for this event. Um, I was asked by the organisers to speak about a very specific issue. So I'm going to confine my comments to, to that point. Um, and that is the fragmentation and competition in the context of sovereign debt crises and sovereign debt restructurings. <clears throat> and that is, of course, a topic which is very close to my heart. Um, I did my PhD on that, but then I was also involved in, in some litigations on, on sovereign debt, both before the English courts and then some local courts or the sovereign debtors. Um, but I realize that this is a topic which is probably very obscure to, to most of the people here. Um, so that what, what I will try to do uh, in, in my comments is to lay some of the fundamentals um, of, the, of the problem um, before diving a bit deeper. So what I will do first, I will speak about the jurisdictional matrix. Um, that is to say the different forums where sovereign debt more generally can be resolved. Um, and when I speak about forum here, as you'll see, I'm not confining myself to courts or arbitration tribunals, but it is also sovereign debt restructurings. So the negotiations between the sovereign data and the creditors. Um, and after that, I will, once I lay out the fundamentals, I will speak about some of the potential clashes or, or competition, if you will, between different forums in the context of sovereign debt uh, restructurings and litigations. Now, let, let me turn first uh, to the jurisdictional matrix. Um, and I think a fundamental point which needs to be made here, and I think this is a point which underlines all the clashes and competition and fragmentation which arises in this context, is that there's no bankruptcy court for sovereigns. There's no bankruptcy regime for sovereigns. Now, if you have a typical company, of course, if a typical company uh, faces a, a solvency crisis, is unable to pay its debt, um, it can file for bankruptcy, as a result of which all the claims against it can be adjudicated and decided in a single set of proceedings. And that, of course, will give a fresh start to the company. But that is not a possibility for the state. The international community at large hasn't been able to agree to a, a, a bankruptcy regime for the states. Now, what the states do instead, instead of resorting to bankruptcy, they engage in informal negotiations with their creditors. So a state which finds itself in a financial predicament will reach out to the creditors, will try to explain, explain its financial predicament, and will try to obtain some concessions because otherwise, if you don't have the concessions, the state would never be able to service his debt. And that is very often done either by what is called extending the maturities of the debt, that is to say, agreeing to for the payment for later payment, or reducing the size of the debt, or both. Now, the immediate consequence of this, and I think a consequence, consequence which is apparent, is that any disgruntled creditor may in principle initiate proceedings against a sovereign, either in domestic courts or in investment arbitration. And, and, and court litigation is very often the norm. Um, the reason for that is 99, 98% of all sovereign bonds contain a choice of court agreement and, and uh, related to choice of law agreements, either in favor of English courts or New York courts. Those are the ubiquitous forums for resolving sovereign debt disputes. In addition to that, of course, it is also possible to litigate in the local courts of the sovereign, but that is not the most preferable position um, because the chances of prevailing in the local courts are relatively low. Now, another feature that I want to highlight is that when we speak about sovereign debt, the enforcement powers are very often concentrated in the hands of trustees. Many sovereign bonds can contain um, trust uh, clauses as a result of which 
the only person who can bring proceedings against a sovereign would be the trustee and not the creditors. Now, of course, a certain percentage of bondholders can require the trustee to go and initiate proceedings, and that is very often the 25% of bondholders. Now, that is different in the context of investment arbitration because very often the trustees will not have standing before investment tribunals, so the bondholders will be the ones bringing proceedings. So this is very broad branch analysis of, of the jurisdictional um, uh, sort of matrix, um, which is available in a sovereign debt context. And now let me turn to the clashes or the competition between different forums in this context. And I think that two main competing areas or two main clashes which arise. First of all, you have the clash between in-court dispute settlement on one hand, and on the other hand, out-of-court negotiations, so the restructurings. And then secondly, within the in-court dispute settlement, you have a clash between domestic courts and investment arbitration. I will start with the first one, so the clash between in-court um, dispute settlement and out-of-court negotiations. And as I said, the, the negotiations are the usual mechanism for resolving any sovereign debt crisis. Um, they they, they sort of take place of any kind of bankruptcy. Every time a state it finds itself in a position where it is unable to go forward with paying the debt, it will resort to negotiations. It will reach out to its creditors and using various stick and carrots, it will try to cajole them into agreeing to some sort of concessions, reducing the debt. And that is very often very successful. The restructurings are in principle very successful. And I think the reason for that is, is, is very simple because the other option, that is to say to insist on repayment, is very often unrealistic. Because if a state finds itself in a position where it requires restructuring, it probably means it would never be able to service its debt without a restructuring. So most of the creditors would very often be very sympathetic to restructuring um, offers, if they're reasonable, of course. But on the other hand, you have some litigious creditors, creditors who are unwilling to consent to restructuring and uh, prefer to engage in, in litigations. And this I call sometimes hold out creditors because they hold out of the restructuring. Uh, a specific group of them are the so-called um, uh, sort of specialized hedge funds, which are sometimes pejoratively called vulture funds for their aggressive litigation strategies. And, and what the, some of them, some of the creditors have, have done is that they've established a very clever practice. Now, what they do is they wait for a financial crisis or a relatively difficult financial situation where the cost of the notes trading on financial platforms, trading platforms drop and you can buy them at a relatively steep discount. And then these creditors will acquire the bonds at a steep discount, say 40%, 50%, sometimes up to 80 and 90%. And then having bought this, the, the bonds, they will consistently refuse to, to participate in the restructurings and instead they will try to um, uh, litigate and obtain the full value of the bonds acquired. Now, the way the international community has dealt with, uh, with this phenomenon is through contractual language. Um, there have been attempts at some point to, in to introduce some, some clauses into the bonds relating to litigation, but what has now become the most popular type of clause is, is a so-called majority action clause. And these majority action clauses, they introduce a type of financial democracy. What I mean by that is um, they permit a majority of bondholders, which is usually 75% of them, to agree to a restructuring. And that decision of the majority will then become binding for all the bondholders, including the ones who never agreed to the restructuring, so the holdouts. Now it is apparent that the effect of these clauses is quite powerful. If you hold bonds which contain a majority action clause, you're facing a dilemma where 
if the majority agrees to restructure the bonds, you'll be swayed by their decision, you'll be bound by their decision. So your litigation strategy takes a very significant blow from this kind of majority action clauses. There are of course different variations of these clauses and, and some problems with some of them, but I'm not going to spend time on that. Now, if you are a holdout creditor and you hold bonds which contain these majority action clauses, then you find yourself in a relatively difficult situation and you have a few options. One is to sit and wait for the majority to decide. And of course, that is very uh, dangerous because if the majority decides to restructure and, and uh, give concessions to the sovereign debtor, then you are bound. The second is to acquire a blo blocking uh, uh, minority. So if you acquire 25% plus one of the bonds, you'll be able to block the decision of the majority. And, and very often that is not going to be very difficult because the bonds are going to be trading at a steep discount so you can acquire them relatively easily. And the third option, which I think is interesting for our purposes, is to engage in preemptive litigation. As a holdout creditor, you realize that the majority may decide to agree to restructuring and bind you to it. So what you do instead is you rush to the court, or at least that's the idea. You rush to the court and try to obtain a summary judgment, saying that the sovereign defaulted and, and therefore uh, I require a uh, summary judgment. And if you obtain a summary judgment as a holdout creditor, then of course you are shielded from the decision of the majority, because now, at least in so far as the financial terms of the bonds are concerned, you have a judgment, and the judgment might not necessarily be trumped um, by the by, uh, by decision of the majority. Now, the counter argument against that, which is raised or which can be raised by the sovereigns, by the respondent states, it is to ask for a stay of proceedings on case management grounds. You can ask for the court to stay the proceedings to give time to the majority to decide the issue, to decide whether they're going to consent to restructuring or not. And the argument of the sovereigns is going to be, well, after all, you as a holdout creditor agreed to these majority action clauses. And now by rushing to the court and trying to obtain a summary judgment, you're trying to avoid the application of these clauses. So I think what I was trying to portray is, is some sort of competition between the two main forums and, and how litigation can be used to challenge or, or to try to obtain an advantage over the um, informal negotiations, which are the restructuring. Now, the last point I want to make here is if a creditor participates in the restructuring, if the creditor tenders his bonds, so if the creditor decides to change his old bonds for the new ones, then of course there is an argument that it will be precluded from going to the court or going to an investment arbitration because he participated in that investment arbitration. And I think the implication here is that um, it, it is um, relatively early on that a creditor should decide what its strategy is going to be. Is it going to be a litigious creditor? Is it going to be a creditor which negotiates? Let me now turn to the um, second clash, and that is a clash between domestic courts and international investment arbitration. As I've said, the, the main forum for sovereign debt um, disputes are either English courts or New York courts. And of course, the reason for that is that the choice of court agreements in favor of either of these jurisdictions are almost ubiquitous in sovereign bonds. In recent times, we have seen some arbitration clauses, either in favor of ICC or CIA arbitration, but they remain a minority in the universe of, of sovereign bonds. And, and I think the reason why creditors prefer domestic courts, and especially English and New York courts, it, it is twofold. First of all, it's relatively easy to establish a jurisdiction of English courts and New York courts. And secondly, it is relatively easy to win on the merits. Now, it is relatively easy to establish a jurisdiction because those are the agreed forums um, as pre-agreed by the parties. So I think that's relatively uncontroversial. And it is also relatively easy to win the case on the merits 
because the question in the English course and in the uh, and, and indeed in the in the new course is going to be to the to the sovereign is going to be did you pay the debt? And if the answer is no, then uh, the the sovereign essentially lost. And various sorts of substantive defenses that can be raised based on public policy, committee, act of state, um, those are going to be very difficult to raise uh, in, in these jurisdictions. Now, of course, there are some limitations to what I said. Um, I think a caveat needs to be made uh, in respect of interim relief and freezing injunctions. They're usually both the English courts and the new courts have shown more freedom, more discretion when it came to enforcing and, and issuing and enforcing uh, various kind of injunctions. Um, I think one example is Camdex and, and the Bank of Zambia, um, which involved a, a creditor who obtained a freezing injunction against the Bank of Zambia, which was a central bank in, in, in Zambia. And the central bank of Zambia uh, issued and uh, printed some of the banknotes of Zambia in London. Now, of course, a very clever, as a very clever creditor, they try to to freeze those banknotes to pay uh, to to put pressure on, on the Bank of Zambia to pay up the debts they were supposed to pay. But the Court of Appeal actually varied the freezing injunction um, and 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 permitted the Bank of Zambia to remove those banknotes from from England. I think it's it's a very interesting decision of the Court of Appeal with Lord Bingham, who was of the view that that's going to be a damage to the economy of Zambia if you locked these banknotes in London. Zambia was a country which was struggling financially. It had huge amounts of debt. Uh, it had very low resources and reserves to pay those debts. So I think the courts are very often able to show more imagination when it comes to, to this kind of relief. But I think the overall point stands, uh, stands once you have a debt which hasn't been paid it's relatively easy to obtain <clears throat> a judgment there. And, and of course, sort of, uh, I spoke about the ease with which you can establish a jurisdiction and obtain a judgment in the English and New York courts. A very strong caveat needs to be made here. Uh, it's the sovereign immunity of states against enforcement. While you might be able to, to obtain a judgment against a sovereign state, of course, it's another completed another story to, to try to enforce that judgment against the state, but I'm not going to go there. So very often, as I said, domestic court litigation is the preferred option. It's quick, it's relatively predictable. But there are instances where investment arbitration is going to be the preferred option, is going to be the sort of last resort, if you will, of creditors. Now, there are various scenarios. Um, you can imagine a sovereign state using some sovereign powers in the context of of a sovereign debt restructuring. Um, we've seen that in the, in the context of the Greek debt restructuring of 2012, where the Greek parliament did a quite unusual thing. They adopted a law, and that law retroactively introduced majority action clauses, of which I was just speaking a second ago. That law introduced majority action clauses into all the bonds governed by the Greek law. That then you might have some other situations. Uh, for instance, there's no choice of court agreement in favor of English courts or New York courts. Let's say you bought some domestic debt and possibly investment arbitration is, is your main resort apart from local courts. Um, or, or you think as a creditor that the sovereign debt restructuring was unfair for some reason, or there were some irregularities with it. And in those cases, domestic, in those cases, creditors, private creditors might prefer to go to investment arbitration. Now, the problem here is, of course, while it may seem very attractive, you may need to overcome several very serious jurisdictional obstacles before you do so. The first one is, do the bonds constitute investment within the meaning of bilateral investment treaties or the India the Exit Convention? I think we had a few decisions um, of investment treaty tribunals. The majority of them say that sovereign bonds are indeed investment. By contrast, um, famously or infamously, depending on your perspective, 
the Postova and then Greece tribunal reached the diametrically opposite conclusion. They said bonds are not investment, both within the meaning of the VAT and also more importantly, within the meaning of the exit convention. I think the second very important question is, even if we assume that bonds are indeed investment, can indeed qualify as investment, do bonds acquired on the secondary markets, do they qualify as investment? Now, let me explain what I mean. So when the bonds are issued for the first time, they're set to be issued on the primary markets, so the, to the primary subscribers. So if you are the primary subscriber, you essentially the one who gives the money to the state. But once these bonds have been issued, they would usually be trading on, on a exchange, on a trading platform. And that is what, what is called the secondary markets. And, and if you acquire bonds on a secondary market, there's no transfer of money to the state. There's a transfer between from one creditor who wants to buy the bonds to another one who wants to sell them. And the question is, of course, can that qualify as investment? And that, that's a particularly thorny question. Um, and another question, which is quite interesting, is can the bonds be set to be invested in the territory of the host state? Many of these bonds, and indeed any other sort of many other financial instruments, they are traded on foreign stock exchanges. They're subject to foreign laws. Can it be said that those financial instruments have been made in, in the territory of the host state, just like we say that, for example, about mining concession or opening a factory in the host state? And of course, even if you overcome these obstacles, even if you establish the jurisdiction of an investment tribunal, you still need to establish a treaty standard uh, violation, which is another question. But even if you do that, there's another very interesting question which remains, the, the question of the quantum. Now, if uh, a creditor acquired the bonds at a steep discount, say at 50% discount, and it initiated investment proceedings, can that investor now claim 100% full compensation? So can it claim full value of these bonds, the par value of these bonds? And the case law seems to be going in different directions there. There are some tribunals indeed, which have found that the, um, the bonds which have been acquired at a discount cannot, do not entitle their holder to full compensation. I think, I think that's what I had for, for these very broad remarks about sovereign debt. And I, I think sort of I'm trying to show a bit of fragmentation which exists in this, in this area. And I think it's probably in, in the interest of everyone for me to shut up and, uh, and, have, and have some questions so we can have a bit of a discussion um, about what we, Chad and I, have, have to say. Well, thank you, Hike. That was a, a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, it goes along well with your uh, 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 your thesis. I, I did read it beforehand. I recommend it to everyone, sovereign defaults before domestic courts. We have one question from the audience, but I'm going to exercise a little bit of moderator dis, uh, discretion because I have a question essentially for both of you. And it kind of goes to our theme here on the multiple courts and tribunals. And I'll start with Jan, um, and, and then I'll tie, say why that ties in with what Hike has said. Your three conclusions, one of which is arbitration is secure. The second one was that enforcement gives arbitration a huge advantage. I, I've seen that repeated a lot in the literature, but when you look at surveys, for instance, the Queen Mary survey, it's tied in many ways with the neutrality of the jurist of the tribunal. And having talked to a lot of in-house counsel, that's what they look for. They look for if we are making an investment, a commercial contract, do we trust the court system? And, and I wonder, because you mentioned that the London Commercial Court has been unaffected, and that's because of the English courts. Likewise, uh, when you say enforcement gives it a huge advantage, any good, you like questions about practice more than theory, you said. In practice, any good barrister will, or solicitor firm will also know to research where the assets are. So it's not about enforcing it in 150 different countries. They often know the very specific countries. And I guess that sort of ties in with Hike's book, because I remember 
Hike mentioned that a lot of these cases, they are directed towards the New York and English courts because those are the, the choices primarily in some of these bonds for the choice of law and the governing law. And, and it would seem, I think from international reputation, people trust the English courts, they trust the Southern District of New York very much. So I guess my question is, is when we're looking at these questions of courts and tribunals, is it still true that number one, the default is litigation for the most part in many situations, except when you have an issue where you definitely need one of those attributes of arbitration? And two, is the real driving force, do you feel comfortable with that court? Because ultimately, um, in a situation where you mentioned about, uh, Hike mentioned about investor arbitration, it would seem that be applicable where there was a state and you had to, he mentioned when you didn't have a choice of law and you had to go into a different domestic court. So is that the key factor is, are you still the default litigation? And does it depend on what's the court that has the jurisdiction? Um, Mel, thank you so much. Let me let me start um, in the same uh, uh, the non erudite way of answering in the way I, I provided my um, presentation. I think it comes down to practically um, what the in house counsel at midnight negotiating the contract. I mean, they've worked on the contract for days or weeks, etc. In obviously in, the, in, a, in a very specific industry or in a very specific center, there is going to be a preference. There may be a preference for the English courts or for the New York courts. There may be a preference for ICC arbitration seated in Paris or Switzerland. Or, but I'm speaking generally now. It really comes down to um, I'm Georgian, you're Chinese. We're not doing it in Georgia. We're not doing it in China. So what do you suggest? And I'm growing really tired of this discussion now. Um, that sounds pretty unsophisticated. That is at least 50% of what happens. Um, I mean, of course, multinationals have very sophisticated legal departments. You need to look at whether there's a David from a negotiating bargaining position, there's a David and Goliath situation between the parties. But often it goes along the lines of, let's just stick in an arbitration clause. And most of Hike's time and my time as counsel is spent on the preliminary question on what on earth is this? Is this an arbitration clause? Is this a court clause? There'll be a reference, it'll say arbitration, but it'll only refer to the London court. So that is what you're dealing with. And this question becomes very expensive for that reason, as we try to work out, depending on our clients' imperatives, whether we'd like to go to the courts or whether we'd like to go to arbitration. So I think that's the practical answer, um, Mel, but in my experience with sophisticated parties, there is still sophisticated commercial parties. I'm putting sovereigns aside for a moment because I really do think that they are a, 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 a creature unto themselves and give rise to sui generis considerations. But when you're talking about private commercial parties, there is still starting point with arbitration. It may be arbitration Paris seat, arbitration London seat, ICC, LCIA, Singapore. But there is, I think generally the starting point is arbitration. I think in certain industries, the starting point is the courts and the courts of a specific jurisdiction. And I'll just pause there. Hike, does, uh, does, it, does the court that's uh in play really make the, the decision between arbitration and, uh, and uh, litigation? Uh, I do, do completely agree with, with John that it's sort of an 11th hour consideration at midnight. You're probably working on a sort of previous draft and then all sort of recycling another agreement and then just either court agreement or an arbitration clause is, is there. Um, I think what might be at play when it comes to financial instruments and not only sovereign bonds, but in principle, financial instruments, is that, I think, twofold. First of all, if you're dealing with relatively complex instruments, so if you're dealing with derivatives, for instance, which are incredibly difficult, and, and, they, and, and the, the documentation is, is a nightmare. Uh, I've done a couple, I mean, you know, it's just 
I wouldn't want to do any one. Uh, but it's, 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 they're very complicated and there's experience, for instance, in the English, uh, in the English course, in the New York course with those, those derivatives, there's a case law. So, so I think there's an inclination to go to the courts. And I think probably an even stronger consideration when it comes to finance is that if you go to arbitration, there, there's a feeling that the arbitrators might decide to cut the baby in two and, and, and give half of the money to the creditor and half to the, to, to the debtor. Um, because you know, each arbitrator is appointed by parties, everyone is trying to push their agenda to some extent, or at least that, that's what they say. Um, but whereas in a, in a court, it's slightly more predictable. You can expect certain results. And if you are the creditors, of course, uh, you as a creditor will have a stronger bargaining power as to, uh, some, as to the sum of the terms when it comes to, um, to, to the documents and including the choice of court agreements. I think there's an inclination with, with some of the big players in the financial markets to go to court litigation. And I suppose you might see some similar characteristics in other areas, but sort of those are quite niche things. And I think in general, it's, it's um, I agree with, with Jan, it's, it's uh, sort of, um, depends on the context and depends on the council. Let me uh, make sure we answer the one question we received from one of the participants and it goes to Jan. Why do you think states are willing to have special courts that have a lot of cost when they can let people go to arbitration centers with zero cost for the state? Well, I mean, I can answer that. Uh, I think it's twofold answer to that. The first is a financial one. Whatever investment you make into your domestic specialized courts, if they are successful, then you're going to make, you know, 10 times that in terms of the investment into the, the, the legal industry or legal services industry in that jurisdiction. So for instance, um, legal London is worth billions. And the success of the LCIA and the success of the commercial court is a, is a government you know, policy agenda item. So um, one needs to look at it financially, at least through that lens. But secondly, I think the second of the question is, it doesn't really work to invest in arbitration in a jurisdiction and to forget about the courts because sophisticated parties are not going to go to arbitration in a jurisdiction where they think the courts will not be able to provide assistance or understand some of the subtleties and complexities of that, that attend to um, uh, arbitral proceedings. This is my point about the two being um, in a mutually supportive role and not actually cannibalizing each other. I mean, the risks of you could go to a very sophisticated ar arbitral institution, new arbitral institution. But the first thing that the in-house counsel is going to say is, well, yeah, I love the rules. This is great. It's, it looks very quick. I'm willing to take the risk, but what are the courts like there in that, um, in, in that region? I mean, what's going to happen if, if the courts need to step in? And I think policy-wise, that's where we've seen some of the more short-sighted, I don't want to point fingers, but some of the more short-sighted decisions that you know these countries will invest huge amounts of money into building a new arbitral center without the same attendant um, attention and investment to the court system. And it's no good, you need both. Um. Let me, let me ask a question for Hike to give him a follow-up. Um, I'm fascinated by these majority clauses that allow restructuring if a certain percentage, I think you said 75% is the default, agrees. And I wonder if something like that, one of the issues you often find in, in some arbitration cases is because it's all about consent. You often will have separate arbitrations for a given fact pattern because you'll have subcontractor contracts, you'll have contractor contracts, et cetera. Has, has there been any, I mean, I guess in an in a intellectual capacity, the idea of inserting clauses that says, I know that some arbitral institutions are trying to make joinder easier, but something that would allow in a contract saying if X percentage of the parties agree to joinder because you've agreed to this, this would be an agreement saying you can't be the one holdout that creates problems. 
have you seen something like that in a different context? Uh, so uh, a, just to understand your question, so clause in you know, sovereign bond, which says that you can be joined to arbitration if you're a holdout creditor. Essentially, yes. So I haven't seen anything like that. So I don't think, so what I've seen with some of the arbitration clauses, of course, you have the sovereign state on one side and then you have a multiplicity of, of bondholders on the others. And sometimes you don't know who they are because they're going to be sort of hidden away in the financial system. Is of course, that will provide for um, a procedure where uh, a certain number of these um, claimants can initiate proceedings in arbitration against the state. Mm -hmm. It will say that all of these parties, I don't know, all of 50, 100 bondholders will appoint one arbitrator and the sovereign will appoint a second. And if the claimants are unable to reach an agreement, of course, the, uh, the appointment will be done by the ICC or CA, depending on where you're arbitrating. But it, it won't be a situation where you're trying to join them, I suppose, because it's not really in the interest of the sovereign to do so. It's in the interest of the sovereign to try to, to, to obtain a majority and restructure. It, it's not in the interest of the sovereign to have as many claimants as, as they can against it. Um, of course, nothing, I suppose, prohibits from launching this, you know, some arbitrations and having establish a precedent where you, you know that you obtained an arbitration award against a state and then the others, you know, initiating separate arbitrations. But I suppose in that context, fragmentation is, is probably unavoidable if you haven't joined all of them together. I think a practical problem that I've seen sometimes is, is, is it's relatively difficult to combine all these claimants together because they their names would never be publicly available. So you have to engage in some sort of printing in newspapers or publishing in Bloomberg or, or some other thing saying, you know what, we're trying to initiate arbitration, would we like to join? Um, so I think that's sort of a, a separate complication which arises there. Of course, you can, I suppose, avoid that by having a trustee initiate the arbitration. Um, that, that's sort of a, a big relief. Um, and then possibly the trustee obtained the judgment in favor of all the claimants. And then whenever it obtains the payment, distributing the the money pro rata to all the bondholders for all the money. So I suppose the trustee mechanism is perhaps the most convenient way of dealing with this multiplicity. Okay. Let me ask you, either of you two experts have a question for each other. I suppose one question for John. John, what do you think is the future of all the different commercial courts apart from the English courts and, and the New York courts? Do you think they're going to fare relatively well in, in this climate? Are they going to attract foreign business? I suppose if you're a Dutch commercial court, Dutch parties may decide to litigate, but apart from the local parties, do you think, or have you seen a sort of a big attraction for foreigners? Uh, the answer to that Hank, is indubitably yes. I mean, I think the, um... I think the name of the game is to attract foreign litigants or, or um, you know, foreign parties, whether it's arbitration, whether it's litigation. But I keep harking back to, you know, the importance of making sure as a jurisdiction that you're in good shape, both as an arbitral centre, as well as uh, a, a centre for commercial dispute resolution through the courts, through litigation. And of course, and this is something that is always said, the sophistication of the legal services market and so on. Obviously, English is, is, a, is a major advantage for New York, for, for London. But, you know, Singapore is doing very, very well, Hike, as you know well, and it's, it's, it's more than caught up. And, but I think, you know, it all militates against a parochial approach. It means that our generation of practitioners, for instance, can't rest on their laurels or or, um, or, or approach and, un, you know, take an unduly sort of parochial approach. You need to be um, a, a council that may have trained in a specific jurisdiction or a number of jurisdictions, but actually you need to show flexibility, whether you're an arbitrator, a council in an international arbitration, whether you're providing, you know, um, 
uh, expert evidence on English law before the Dutch court, which is tasked with applying that English law. So it'll be interesting, but it's certainly become much more competitive than it was um, uh, 20 years ago. I think my corresponding question to you um, would be around investment arbitration. I mean, investment arbitration has its own problems at the moment. I author a not very much read chapter on covered investment. And so um, I, I know of the uh, decision of which you speak, read bonds, but do you, where do you see the future <clears throat> of these disputes in, in investment uh, arbitration? It's, well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. I think, I think we need to recognize that, that sovereign debt restructurings are very special. Yeah. And a state which is dealing with a restructuring faces a huge limitations and pressure. And the decisions on who to include in the restructuring and to, who to save from the restructuring are not taken very lightly. There are serious yes. policy considerations at stake. So what we have seen is, is some investment treaties expressly excluding bonds from, from their coverage. So I think we've seen that CAFTA with some BATs because the states are very much leery of, of subjecting themselves and their sort of sovereign debt restructurings to sovereign um, to, to investment tribunals. And I think that there's going to be a, a trend, I suppose, for some time, especially for those states which have suffered from sovereign debt restructuring. And of course, we have this recurrent sovereign data to go through restructuring. I think I think that's one possibility. But I think we need to think a bit more creatively about investment arbitration and how it can actually deal properly. Because I suppose a, a very um, unspecified application of investment treaty standards to the yeah. sovereign debt restructuring may cause quite a bit of damage, perhaps more at times than the, the benefit it brings in. So I think it it does require some thinking and some innovation when, when dealing with those with those disputes. And of course, you, you still have a significant minority or perhaps majority of tribunals which will consider these to be outside of the scope yes. of the investment treaty protection. Um, so time, time will, will tell. Well, I think we've come to the end of our program. We've gone way over, but then, of course, we've had a wonderful discussion along the way. So I would like to once again thank you both for your participation for today. Uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Hike. Uh, on behalf of the Cambridge Arbitration Society, I do need to give a notice that we, I guess we have another program next Wednesday on June 16th. Uh, Maritime Arbitration, the LMAA and the Suez Canal Ever Given Case Study. I hope you all can tune in for that. But uh, for, on behalf of us, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending and uh, have a good day. Take care now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.